Welcome to Stock Cheat Sheets, where we trend, rank, and grade stocks and exchange traded funds. Our data helps forecast which parts of the market are about to get hot and which equities are likely to blow up in your face. You can subscribe and get cheat sheets delivered to your inbox. Best of all, it's free. Go to stockcheatsheets.substack.com to learn more. Now, here's today's free update. You know, Double A, I got to say, I spent most of the last 24 hours looking for the blow up in your face part. And what'd you find? Ah, boy, I'll tell you what. Traders, I think they're expecting it's not imminent unless it's a bank, then it could be imminent. But uh, I, I would say in general, folks are positioning for the eventuality that the stock market blows up in our face this year. Okay. And you'll see that in relative strength trends and trading signals. And I'm probably not telling you anything you haven't seen in your own trade analysis. I, I, I've seen I've seen a market that um, is just the, the strong opinions both ways and not much in yeah. the middle. Yeah, that's right. And not much holding up the market. It is very it's, narrow. Yeah, it's it's the generals. It's been it's Apple. It's Google. It's Tesla. It's those it's those names. Um, as we transition into a couple of news items from late Friday, you may not have seen the um, uh, to the premium subscribers of Cheat Sheets. By the way, I'm Mike O'Connor. I'm the architect of Cheat Sheets, and AA is my longtime trading partner. We've been doing this for better part of 12 years. We used to rep Chicken Analytics, which is still a tool we love. Uh, uh, now we're kind of uh, doing our own thing, but we get together uh, to talk uh, big picture macro every uh, every weekend, and then of course I send out free updates to all access base level subscribers. And then I also have a group of uh, premium subscribers who are really serious about making money in the market. And I've defined some cheap uh, data services that make it uh, possible to sort of kind of predict what's more likely to happen than not without having to break the bank. Cause most of these data services charge a shit ton of money and we charge five bucks a month. So if you're a premium subscriber, we'd love to have you, uh, but we'd love to have you just as a regular old fashioned regular subscriber or you go to the stockcheatsheets.com sorry it's stockcheatsheets. i got to get a real url don't i stockcheatsheets.substack.com to sign up for your free all access membership so what i was alluding to earlier were i think some pretty troubling signs this is one analyst's urgent warning about Deutsche. i hadn't heard of deutsche bank being in trouble at least not for this you know They've been the Trump money laundering partner, but not the allegedly. Yeah. So what's going on here? It's basically Deutsche Bank is the next domino to potentially fall. You know, from what I read, and this just emerged, you know, late Thursday, early into early Friday. From from what I've read, and it hasn't been much. Um, their bond swaps just widened out, which was that's right. A it's the CDS of, spike that's the concern. Credit yeah, default which swaps. Was, Right, yeah. right. So um, that's about the extent of what I know. But there's there's a lot of eyes on Deutsche Bank this weekend. And then, of course, I think the more alarming bit, which also came out after the bell on Friday, sort of during the dumping ground, is this pretty dire warning from Moody's. Which is about fear of contagion spreading well beyond the banking sector and the that they anticipate some pretty drastic financial and economic damage as the result of what's going on now. I think what, what SVB did, my suspicion is what, is what SVB did was it opened everyone's eyes to Silicon Valley bank, Silicon Valley bank. It yeah. opened everyone's eyes to open the market's eyes to the fact um, that if marked to market, the assets that these banks hold are, are, are far less than, than, you know, what they're representing now in their, in their, right. you know, what they call the hold to maturity yep. um, category mark to market. They have problems. So hopefully they don't have to mark to market. Yep. You know, and, I'm underwater and, in a bunch of spreads that but I, I have a technique for managing them, but if I were to mark those to market right now, it would show, you know, right now I'm showing about $4,000 of profits for the year doing a kind of a credit spread strategy in my account. But if I were to mark what's currently live to market, I would wipe out 100% of my gains yeah. uh, for the year. I'm, you know, negative, I'm plus 4,000 on paper, but I'm minus 4,000 in current assets that are underwater. And it just goes to show you, if you do that, and 4,000 for me is decent risk management. But can you imagine a bank that, that tried to take, um, you know, those 
0.01 yielding accounts and to try to improve profit margins by investing that money into, they'd have to do some really high yield stuff to get any kind of spread. And that's what happened. And then here comes the Fed with a 4,500% rate hike cycle in less than a year. It, it, and I'll tell you, just because I've 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 listened to um, Zandi, who's the chief economist uh, for Moody's Analytics, I've listened to him for a long Mark time. Mark Zandi, right? Yep. Um, the, the concern is, and it makes a lot of sense. The concern there, as far as spread, is um, into the commercial real estate uh, holdings and, and assets that these banks have, because yep. you know, local, regional, community banks are the banks that uh, invest in commercial projects in in in, in metros, right? They're and, the linchpin of the economy. They're they're holding a lot of of that paper, and commercial real estate is 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 in a bad place. Yep. Not to mention the fact that that paper was lent when rates were much lower, so a lot of the same problems just now in a new sector. So we have that. We also have Janet Yellen, um, who sort of made the offhanded remark. I think it was in her testimony in front of Congress that, uh, hey, there's no guarantee we're going to be a perma bailout source for depositors that are beyond the FDIC limit, right? So that was, uh, we were put on notice that they're not going to necessarily uh, um, socialize losses in perpetuity, although but I think also, they will. But <laughs> also, she tried real hard the next day to reel that back in. Right. Yeah. yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, finally, the um, I think the big tell is that the uh, that special discount window lending program the Fed announced for to kind of as a test, this was a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, to a couple of weeks ago, as part of their SVB bailout, right? SVB bailout. It was a, um, it's a window where you can go get money to cover uh, runs on the bank, essentially. Yeah, it's it's it it allows the banks to borrow against their assets without having to mark them to market. So right. they exchange those those you know quote unquote underwater assets, treasuries. Uh, to the Fed at face value. So 164 billion plus the first week, um, 163.9 the second week. So it seems like the banks are reaching out for the helping hand. Yes, and and they do it anonymous, on, anonymously, from what I understand. So we don't know. So we don't know who's um, in trouble. Yeah. Now, is there any? I, I realize I'm throwing a curveball at you, and you're not an expert at this. Is there any nefarious scenario that you've heard about where? This is money that people can line up, you know, banks can line up to and uh, and just simply put it in a, uh, a CD that yields 5% right now. Is there any possibility that um, we could be rewarding bad behavior and giving managers a chance to make a bonus? Or do you think this is all legitimately uh, sourced loans to help banks that are really in trouble? So, so like you said, I'm not I'm not an expert, but from what I understand, um, this is this is a last resort for banks. They're, this yeah. they're there because they have to be. This yeah. isn't this isn't dollars that's finding its way into the economy. This isn't an inflation. Like I, I think if they're there, they're in pain and they need to be there. Yep, sort of like the Americans that uh, to a T when you see the news coverage about them visiting a food bank, they're always the first to say, you know, I've never been in trouble before. I always pay my bills, but I just can't afford to pay my rent and eat. And so there they are at the, yeah. and the food bank here in Austin is, uh, you know, for a, for a rich town that has a lot of job openings, there's sure, sure a lot of people using it right now. Yep. And that's troubling to me and kind of a, a sign that not everything is, is right. Yeah. And I'm wondering, double A, do you think we're starting to move into a situation now that the fed has kind of laid their cards on the table, right? And we're going to get into that in a minute here as we kind of go through the data that's, that's due, due out is that I think everyone agrees that they're closer to the end of the hikes. No, certainly no visibility as to when they're going to start cutting other than it's not going to be this year likely. Um, but uh, with the hiking over and so that the risk of explosive rate hikes short of some kind of inflationary data that we just nobody anticipated, that, do we move into a bad economic news is actually bad news now? It, it's, 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 it's kind of it's starting to feel that way, although I, I, I think it still depends on what what news we're talking about. Right. right. Is this economic news? Is this you know real estate? What, you know, right. But but yeah, I, I, it's heading that way. The news that portends of severe slowing of the economy used to be a, 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 a reason for the stock market to celebrate and would rally. 
because the implication was that the Fed was going to pivot. And I think that uh, every, I think the, there's been enough Jerome Powell cold water wake ups for market participants to know that that pivot is not going to happen in even, you know, I think he's kind of laying the scenario for even sort of a mild disruption that might have resulted in immediate action in the past. They're going to kind of let things get a little rocky here because they're so concerned about inflation. That's on one hand. But on the other hand, some of their actions kind of admit to me that they're, they know they're in a box. So for example, uh, to a T, the governors all increased their expectations for inflation, but did nothing about the, well, one, I think there's one dot plotter who uh, forecasts slightly higher rates, but otherwise it was five one, right? Peak rate hasn't changed at all, despite increases in inflation expectations among Fed governors. I mean, to me, watching that, it, it seems like they were trying to give themselves future room. Yeah. Right. It, 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 and it, just real quick, I'll add, as far as inflation goes, um, I, 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 I think the problem, not the problem, but um, the unknown is is how how long will in will inflation stay elevated, right? Because yep. nine to five, you know, nine nine percent to five percent, you know, took a year. And Are we at five now, or is it still at six? It's still at six, but the okay. expectation is in the next couple months we'll be closer to five. Yeah. Okay. Um, but how long will five to two take? That's right. that's going to be the rocky part, especially. And I know it's I, I I know it's very geographically sensitive, but real estate year over year is still showing appreciation, and in certain markets around the country, real estate is still. Um, pretty hot with bidding wars and all these things still happening. Rents are still elevated. And I only mentioned that because that's forty percent of C shelter is forty percent of CPI. So if 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 those things the demand remains on those things, that's forty percent of the CPI number. That that could, at least in my view, um, serve to make that five to three in mm. the CPI uh, CPI quite difficult. I mean, what do you think? So a, a good segue into, as we kind of peruse the data that's upcoming this week, I think the Case-Shiller home price index, uh, I mean, that the experts are forecasting a pretty big dip in terms, and we're still talking about increases, right? But now the median increase drops from 4.6. I think these are year-over-year -year figures, if I'm not mistaken. Or are they month-over-month? Month? Is that a 4.6 to 2.5 month-over-month home price accelerator, or is that year-over-year? -year? If you uh, know. I'm uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't. I'm not sure that it, it seems there. to me. See again, if this were consumer goods, that would be a year over year number. But uh, yeah, home prices are a different animal. But anyway, the point here is they're only forecasting the pace of increase to slow down. And right. you're not even seeing that, right? Is that what you're telling me? You're it, seeing it, an acceleration still he, he, here in Denver, um, yeah. in the Denver metro area. Um, it's still quite competitive. It's there's yeah. still, you know, if if you're on the market and you're priced right, you're going to get a couple offers. For and sure. I'm in Austin where that's probably also not a, not a probably not a good representative scenario. I mean, prices have exploded here. And at least the Zestimates aren't going down yet. Yeah. Yeah. Although I would say we're we're so poised for correction here in Austin. Typically what happens after those parabolic moves. Consumer confidence forecast still to be above 100. So that means that the uh, consumers are fairly confident what's going on. So to me, anything that shatters that confidence, like a cascade of bank failures, that's, I think, another case of uh, bad news actually being bad news. Bad news, yeah. What about pending home sales? I mean, they're actually forecasting a contraction there. I guess that's because something you probably as a mortgage broker are used to dealing with, right? This is uh, loans not going through because they no longer qualify. You know, as rates come down, and I do think rates will continue to come down, and I, th I think you have a slide on that coming up. Um, uh, I, I think th that particular problem becomes less and less. Um, yeah. I think you know, it's, it's everything's shown to be very correlated to interest rates, um, and also there's a less inventory on the market. All those things you hear from every yeah. you know real estate person ever, but and we don't um, mean Fed rates coming down. We're talking about just the commercial uh, mortgage. Uh, mortgage rates and, and really consumer credit in general. We think that, and there's strong evidence that um, the uh, bond community is pivoting to a flight to safety, uh, bidding up the price of bonds and that interest rate because they're scared about recession or worse, right? Deflationary spiral brought about by a banking collapse. 
Um, right. Yeah. So referring to the you know 30 year fixed mortgage rate. And, right. and yes, it was interesting to see when the SVB thing, uh, Silicon Valley Bank uh, event happened, that relationship, uh, that flight to safety with bonds reemerged. And we yeah. haven't seen that since the bear market started. Yep. So, and, and that was a really big change. And that happened after SVP. That's exactly right. Yeah. So GDP is not, it doesn't look like that's going to be market moving. That's a second revision. So that's usually old news and uh, it won't be new news until we get, uh, uh, until we get near the end of uh, Q1 and we start anticipating this year's GDP. Um, initial jobless claims. I think that's a case of bad news probably being good news because the market wants to see the Fed's policy is starting to work because they do want to see rate cuts in 2024. It, as far as jobless came, claims go, what, what I've been following is that there's they're actually a slowing just a little bit. But yeah. once you're there, it's harder to find a job. Once once you've reached the unemployment line, it's becoming more difficult to get hired. Yep. So there's also a bunch of Fed speak here, and uh, we're going to get into some um, uh, some cost indexes like. I think the PCE index will be mildly interesting. You know, again, market participants will not like an increase in PCE year over year, month over month, but especially month over month. Um, and the forecast is for PCE and generally, generally to come down. I think the personal spending number coming way down is what's, you know, both nominal uh, personal income uh, and personal spending both coming down. Mm -hmm. Um Business barometer flat, uh, consumer sentiment, at, uh, that'll be the final number for uh, this month, uh, flat at 63, and then a bunch of Fed speak. So um, not a whole lot that's market moving, in my opinion, compared to this past week. Yeah. yeah. You want to take a look at cheat sheets because um, it really does speak to, I think, the issue that we mentioned at the outset, which is investors certainly aren't buying stocks. Uh, they're very selective in what they're buying. And you're getting kind of a, I don't know how to describe it, double A, but there's there's nothing that I feel like I need to pile into for fear of missing out right now. It's it's pretty squishy out there, but at the same time, it's hard to go short. I agree. I mean, uh, I, I heard somebody that I follow refer to it as, as a tinderbox. It, yep. it's oh, just, that's a great it's, word. Yep. It's just, it's looking for a spark to do a big move one way or the other. All the data we're going to share with you speaks to that. So the first thing that strikes me is, you know, let's let's put the Eurozone off to the side for a second. That one has been outperforming uh, markets for a while, but um, but it's starting, as you'll see, it's starting to fall, rotate out of favor. And I think the ECB defied expectations by raising 50 basis points a week and a half ago. And so that Eurozone put over the rest of the world that may be coming to an end as they fight inflation, but it has been outperforming for months. Yeah. The biggest story is tech. Everything's riding on tech. I mean, look at the, the tailwind score, which for those of you new to cheat sheets, we take 10 factors that are um, publicly available. So there's none of what I have in here in the model is a, um, it, you know, is a proprietary indicator. These are all very standard followed um typical technical indicators, but they're rolled together in a way that makes them unique and proprietary. And the tailwind percentage is a proprietary metric that's meant to give you an idea of what the health of the market is today when looked at in the aggregate or on any one index, how it compares. Generally, you don't if you're a bull, you don't touch anything under 50. You're very selective between 50 and 60. The good news about a 50 to 60 is that room to run if you're right, the bad news with 50 to 60 is there's there's almost as many things that that, that are um, negatively indicated as there are positive indications. So that your failure rate is going to be higher, but your reward to risk payout, if you're really good at parsing those uh, instruments that are in the 50s. And then really 60 to 85 is the sweet spot. Above 85, the tailwind score would tell you that you're starting to get closer to the end than the beginning mm -hmm. where... Um, the downside risks, uh, you know, I'm more of a covered call, um, uh, vertical uh, spread uh, buyer or put vertical seller. So in other words, my bullish trades are always hedged above 85. And I think you, I mean, with in your system, you're similar. You, you don't let, you don't let the sparks fly unless you're, you, unless the market has really got a lot of wind at your back. Right. That's right. 
Hence the tailwind score. So just to look at this, it's the cues and everything else. We have positive uh, trends in the long, intermediate, short term. We're using 1040 moving average pairs to make that determination uh, weekly, daily, and uh, hourly. Uh, buying pressure is basically money flow. And so if we're under bullish, uh, neutral plus is a fairly anemic money flow. It's between 0.05 and 0.1. I consider 0.1 money flow to be bullish and absolutely a rock solid number, especially if it can be persistent. And above 0.2, institutions are really helping you. That's like an institutional put under you uh, that uh, the stocks will still correct, but they just won't crash. You've got um, you get the wind at your back for as long as institutions are bidding that up. Relative strength, we have two uh, metrics that just represent uh, the cheat sheets trend following system time horizon. This is not a good time to be a trend follower. The market does not give us that kind of um, uh, upside right now. Uh, but in a trending market, we like to see uh, stuff that outperforms the broad market uh, on a three month basis and a six month basis. And in between those numbers, that's what we refer to as the sweet spot. Great for a weeks to months hold. And uh, that's, I believe, that when you're a directional trader, uh, you, you make your uh, you, you make more money playing in that time frame, ta- not not including the the factor that taxes uh, play. Um, so that's the relative strength, and we're basically we compare everything against the the, the broad IWV market. It's basically the Russell 3000, and then here we're just organizing things into buckets on a relative basis. So the more bullish you are. The more other stocks you're outperforming, the more bearish you are, the fewer. And But we also, in other uh, charts that we're going to share with you as part of our cheat sheet service, even our free service, is relative strength on a, a real specific level where we pit one instrument against the other. And then finally, I'm not going to go into it now, uh, but we could spend hours. Both Double and I have been students of this indicator for, well, I've been going on 15 years. I think you're at least a decade, if not longer. Yeah. The market yeah. forecast. Yeah, about that. Yep. But there are a few things I think relevant to today's discussion, Double A. Maybe uh, you can uh, take over for me while I clear my throat. Talk a little bit about the momentum uh, indicator and why that can be kind of important in the very short run, especially when it goes to an extreme. The moment, so we're talking momentum indicator within the market forecast tool, which correct? Is a, yeah. a TD tool, got it. Um, it, 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 it basically. I'm not sure I have a great explanation, like how to articulate that. I don't know how to use the tool, but um, the, the when momentum is ro- it, so, all of these are oscillators. All four time frames. We have the months to a couple of years. We've got that's the long term. We've got the uh, uh, weeks to months, which is sort of my time horizon for as a trend follower. Uh, that's the intermediate um, forecast oscillator. Then we have the near term, which is sort of the swing trading time frame. It's you know. A few days to up to a couple of weeks. It's the it, it's what it would take for a stock to swing from a a, a higher or lower uh, low to a higher or lower high. Uh, and then you've got the near term forecast and the momentum forecast. Those are both what I'd call junior time frames. Near term, as I said, under two weeks. Uh, momentum more like a one to three day sort of a day trading uh, time horizon. And the, when those two oscillators, and all of these are oscillators, so they are like, think of them if if price changes are the speedometer, meaning you know price went from X to X over how many days, this would be the accelerator pedal. Are we speeding up or are we slowing down? And by knowing whether we're speeding up or slowing down in certain time horizons, we can extrapolate that to future expectations for price. And these things interact in concert, and when they do, we can draw certain conclusions. So the momentum indicator, when it finishes at an extreme low, and so remember, all oscillators are zero to 100, we define extreme low, the danger zone to be under five on that zero to 100 scale. So 95% of the time, it doesn't happen. And the extreme high would be, um, if 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 I didn't say under five, that's what I meant to say, and then above 95 would be an extreme high. Well, when that happens, that means you're basically the market is putting the pedal to the metal or slamming on the brakes. And that has a ripple effect. Just like if double A, if, if I slam on the brakes and double A isn't seat belted in and we don't have airbags, I'm turning that double A uh, face into, a, you know, more, more of a face made for radio. Right. <laughs> uh, 
And so it upsets the apple cart. And then that can, so it can have a cascading effect. And momentum is where reversals or trend interruptions happen. So whenever you see a, a momentum score that's below five, I usually expect at the very least a, de, a, a trend delay. So we move into a consolidation phase for maybe sometimes it's only a couple of days. Sometimes it's weeks and sometimes it's months. It just depends on how extreme the momentum slowdown is and how many other forecast oscillators are affected. But sometimes what can happen is the momentum can be so strong that institutions are selling right up until the last minute for the closing bell rings that there's a cascading effect that affects the near-term line, which would then finish below 20, which is its kind of line in the sand number. And then the uh, intermediate market forecast uh, oscillator, all it has to do is change direction and it can be affected. And sometimes a momentum uh, breach uh, below five can affect all three, all three of those timeframes in one trading day. And when that happens, that's where we're, we start to talk about reversal. And so that's where the momentum line, it's certainly not nothing that you would use in isolation to set up a, any kind of a trading system, but it's one that can really keep you out of trouble if you respect it and ignore trades that even happen the, a day or two following them. Uh, but you can also look at it as a really leading indicator for potential uh, trend to unfold. So that's the momentum indicator is going to be important for today's discussion, especially when we look at financials. For those of you who are premium cheat sheet subscribers, you know that over the weekend, I sent out something in KRE where just about every one of the regional banks had a momentum score under five, suggesting that something was wrong, and mo meaning more news was going to break out. Double, it might have been just the Deutsche Bank news, which I think happened Friday, didn't it, after the bell? Yeah, that was a late Thursday into Friday story. Yep. So that, that could be what that is. But I, I guess that's probably more than I was expecting to give. But with that, would you say that's a fair kind of summary of the market forecast? I think that's a great explanation. And, and you articulated that far better than I ever could have. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's funny. We, we know it when we see it, but it's harder to explain. It's so true. And there's so many different combinations that lead to things. And I know that in cheat sheets, it can sometimes sound like I'm talking gibberish. So we try to repeat ourselves over and over again, there's no four oscillators, in my opinion, uh, out of the many. Um, you know, I think of the market forecast four oscillators to be more powerful than the RSI. For those who understand how to use the RSI, boy, you use the market forecast in conjunction with that tool, you're even better. So think of these as building blocks. Um, and I would say that we saw on, um, and I'm going to move from the global markets, which just basically lack breadth. And let me know if you can see what I'm doing now. I'm I'm basically enlarging the global diversified asset chart. Did you see yep. me do that? I see it. Okay, great. And so you can see the cues there. Mm -hmm. And you'll see here, what I was going to say is gold is kind of telling a uh, sort of a contradictory story. And I think that gets to the heart of today's meeting is there is definitely some hedging about Armageddon. But I would say the buy-in isn't there. I mean, the markets had a pretty good day on Friday. And uh, and gold, which had just started to emerge, for those of you in following us, the uh, the relative strength trend had become really pretty persistent. Um, money flows started to inch up there in gold. But all of a sudden, Friday came along and gold's pullback, it was really overextended. And I was expecting it to float down over a two to five day period. And this was only day one of the pullback, but we already got the under five momentum reading, which tells me not that gold is done, but it tells me that the market hasn't made up his mind and is going to go into a, a consolidation of some kind that'll lead to a technical pattern of compressed lows and highs. And it's going to either break out or break down. But I think gold went on pause um, on Friday, in my opinion, based on that, yeah, that I mean, game, uh, print. So going back to Friday, you know, and as we both know, gold is extremely correlated to the dollar, right? right. So as the do as the dollar is is testing its floor of support, gold touched that two thousand dollar level, which had served you know as right. its area of resistance. So the two are, are trying to find, yep. you know, are we going to go higher, lower, or are we going to bounce around in, in a range here? And gold is hard because sometimes it's a non correlated holding, and other times it's highly correlated. And what AA mentioned, when it becomes highly correlated is when the dollar is losing value. And, uh, you know, our American multinational companies love that. 
because they can repatriate overseas earnings at relatively cheap prices. And it's a it's a tailwind to their their earnings. But other times, especially when there's a threat of bank collapse contagion or any kind of um, economic turmoil that would cause a deflationary downward spiral, re deep recession or worse, gold usually does really well. I remember trading it when I was a an idiot who didn't know really what he was doing in 2007, eight. And um, I made my money blindly, but it was always on the worst market days. Yeah. And, and as we near, you know, another fiscal cliff, I, I imagine if, if, if that situation becomes uh, yep. more inflamed, gold will benefit from, from that chaos. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think that it, that may still be two or three months away. I think June, yeah. July is the latest reading, but I would say that the, um, the Marjorie Trailer trash greens are starting to already, um, you know, the blame it on Biden rhetoric has begun. That there's a there's a contingency that really want to collapse the U.S. economy because they think it's the way to get back into power, and so they're going to take our money for you know along with us and probably, um, you know, uh, hoodwink a whole bunch of people that should be totally against this to go along with it, and right. um, and we're all going to lose probably some money as a result of of that. But I think that fiscal cliff, what you're describing, would be U.S. debt ceiling. Uh, money we've already spent, where the Congress may get in the way of r raising that debt ceiling, which would cause us then to default in our bonds. And if that happens, double A, I don't know what the f do you think is this flight to safety, <laughs> or do you think interest rates spike, or both? That's a know, really good question sure. because uh, you know if 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 the U.S. isn't isn't good for its debts, who wants to hold their bonds? That's right. But I, I don't I don't know the answer. Um, yeah. Maybe gold and maybe gold is the answer. Well, what's interesting is foreign, as you're going to see in the relative strength charts, uh, foreign government um, central, uh, I'm sorry, um, sovereign bond funds are starting to do well. Interesting. Uh, so here in this more expanded chart, um, basically, the story is still precious metals. Um, but with that caveat, you'll notice, too, that BWX, which is the Bloomberg International uh, Bond uh, Series and the... Um, DBB, the base metals, so silver, those all sort of were kind of went along for the ride with gold. So it's all basically, I think, a do basically the dollar story uh, was causing that. And what precipitated the dollar move uh, on Friday? Just was it just a technical bounce? You know, I I, I think it's probably a result of the uh, interest rate move this week. Yeah. Yep, probably right. It's all all connected, right? It is. It's all connected. Yeah. Yep. So um, let's look at the same collection of assets now, but with a different filter. This is more of a relative strength, and um, I'm not going to do the my market forecast soliloquy here. But if you find if you're a bullish trader, and you can find stocks that are starting to outperform other stocks. And a lot of times that price outperformance is almost undetectable, but it starts to form a pattern. And that's usually a precursor to a move, you know, against the kind of the, the, the median point. And, and so we, we light up three more commonly known assets, the ACWI, which is basically the world economy, market cap weighted, SPY, which is the US large cap market and TLT, which is an ETF that doesn't quite reflect 10-year treasuries, but it's I think it's used as a proxy yeah. in ETF land. And then everything is sort of uh, scored, you know, versus those funds and versus each other here. And this, this little symphony of green and red bars really gives you an incredible roadmap uh, to what's going on. And so some things I see, AA is, despite what I said about um, the momentum score, you can't argue with the persistent relative strength of precious metals, even you know silver, which is corrected, is and, and doesn't have a great money flow outlook, is still pretty persistent, isn't it? It it, it is. The the thing that jumps right out at me off this page is of the top, you know, five or six between silver and, and call it TLT. Q, the Qs just don't seem to belong in that mix, do they? They don't, because they don't like. Uh, periods of financial constriction. They need capex. They need um, uh, uh, VCs lending money, and they don't generally work well in a banking crisis environment. 
I mean, I, I, I can't help but imagine, I think that the reason that they're doing well is the idea that, you know, money's becoming cheap again and, yeah. and, and they, and they live on cheap money, but at the same time, yeah. cheap money into a recessionary environment probably isn't the best for the cues. That's right. And BWX there, there's that, uh, basically an index of sovereign nations that aren't the U S their version of treasury bonds. Got it. Yeah. Uh, so meaning they're starting to outperform. U.S. and that is probably that impending debt uh, ceiling issue, and then you know underneath it again more evidence that traders are positioning for something ugly coming. Um, maybe you can share with me uh, why the market generally considers the yen a safe haven currency, and it does it definitely does better at during hard times. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember um, it was late last year, there was an article out that I read, and, and I think I shared it with you about yen's correlation to gold. The yen and, and gold is, is they're highly correlated. Highly correlated yep. Yeah. And is it, again, related to the dollar? Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. But um, but the yen, the yen is interesting to watch here. It, it basically yep. confirms gold's move and vice versa. That's right. And I would call that all part of a, and then TLT's move, look at the relative strength rotation through the sweet spot, right? So outside the sweet spot, we were 27th, 23rd, 24th, 23rd. It was all about interest rates. And this is the long end of the curve, mind you, 20 years out, right? Yeah. And, Again, um, and then obviously um, uh, rotation into favor, but not with a whole lot of, not with a, a bunch of money flow. So this is not a FOMO move, but it is a, it's just a click over, right? It's, and, and I think we both agree, this is probably a signal that, um, you know, the curve is about as inverted as it's going to get, right? Yeah, I think so. And so rates are not likely to go up that much more because the Fed has now broken something. And, but then again, you've got TLT, BND, you've got the British pound, which is just a, uh, I guess that's relative to the euro and and the dollar, right? The the, the Brits held off on their tightening uh, for a while, but um, it's it, there's just where are stocks? We have we haven't. I don't think I've mentioned other than Q's, which we agree doesn't belong there. Right. <laughs> we haven't mentioned that in this this relative strength list. No, I see I see DIA about you know three quarters of the way down your list here. Uh, very briefly, let me explain the uh, bullish watch list candidate. There are three things that must be true to get a bullish designation. Um, and then there's also a very bullish designation, but we're not seeing that yet. Um, the bullish designation means that we need the, um, the asset to be performing on average in that sweet spot. So between the 120 and 90 days, it's, its average score has to be the, the top 50% of all stocks in the stack. Okay, so it's, a, it's, a, it's not an absolute um, number. It's a comparative number. That's every stack has a different size. It will compare only those stocks against one another uh, and score you either on average in the top 50% or not. Money flow has to be 0.1 or better. And um, and then the trend to for a bullish designation, you must have either the intermediate trend or the long-term trend. So if you look at the kind of the trend outlook over there, you've got the uh, shortest term trend on the left and the longest term trend on the right. So the two rightmost trends, one or both need to be lit up to get that bullish designation. And uh, and then basically the standards kick up from there and why you're not seeing any very bullish designations is we add to those criteria, uh, the need to have money flow at 0.2, not 0.1. Uh, and we need not only the asset to be in the top 50% in the sweet spot, but in the period between the last kind of uh, uh, area of the sweet spot, that uh, 60 day look back period and 10 days, we have to be in the top third there. So we have to be increasing in relative strength over the shortest time uh, period. And so that's why it's a much tougher uh, bar to hit. And in market conditions like this, um, it's not going to happen. Hey, one other thing about this chart, double A. Yeah. Look at, um, and I guess we'll use DBO. DBO does not track the spot price of oil, by the way. It's, an, it's a commodity based ETF. Um, it basically does a basket of futures contracts that represent different uh, expirations. So it's not meant uh, to help a trader exploit a market in what's called uh, contango or backwardation for that matter, but probably more backwardation than contango, meaning uh, when the spot price is more expensive down the road, it's a little bit, um, this ETF probably reflects it a little better. Um, and, but notice that DBO 
and other energy related ETFs and commodity ETFs are all finishing way down here on the uh, the curve. Uh, and the price of oil is what? Still in the mid 60s, isn't it? Uh, I believe so. I think it's in maybe high 60s, but yeah, it's high 60s. In the 60s. Yeah, yeah. Um, but look at the money flow score. Hmm, that's interesting. So, so it's, it's, it's uh, to me, it reflects an expectation that this isn't going to last. We're heading into the driving season, and there's probably, um, you know, there's probably going to be an oil market disruption of some type here. I don't think Russia is going to sit around and stand for oil in the 60s um, without doing something about it. Right. We'll see. Uh, unfortunately, you're probably right. But China is probably taking advantage of a pre pretty incredible price because they get a discount above the spot price of oil from Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's got to be like in the 40s uh, per barrel mm -hmm. at this point. And also, uh, while there's no discount, at least that I'm aware of, uh, hopefully we're refilling our our SPR as we, you know, as the as the indicated at, at seventy or below. They should be. That was where, and that's probably another reason why people are uh, buying oil. I'm sure their puts came due. Yeah, yeah. They're sold puts. So oil was assigned to them, and then they're expecting the Biden administration to follow through with its uh, uh, oil buying to refill the strategic petroleum reserves. So in summary, and I think we, you and I both agree, when you look at precious metals, yen, oil week, and even things like tips suddenly in favor of being the flight to safety, the market overall, the globe is positioning, but not necessarily panicking for some type of, it might be a black swan or just a persistent down move. I would, I, I would say it's, it's not an optimistic set of circumstances for equity traders. You know, I'll, if I could, I'll add to that real quick. And, and and you've said it in this meeting is breadth. There is breadth is very limited. New highs, new lows. Those things also cause me a great deal of caution right here. And here's that uh, basically in a nutshell where you're seeing now relative strength of just global stocks. We take commodities and bonds out of there. And so you've got the cues very healthy, rotating into favor. No longer, though, with uh, bullish money flow. It's only neutral plus money flow. It is uptrending. Um, but other than that, money flows and or relative strength trends um, are either not happening or weakening. Look at the bottom part of the chart. So uh, EFA is developed markets. Um, on the far left, you'll see that they've averaged over um, the, th uh, th the past three to six months, averaged third in terms of uh, outperformance. But now you compare that to the most recent look back period on the complete opposite side, that's seventh. And you can see a transition from or from green to orange and red. And that's true of Eurozone. It's really just starting to happen in the Eurozone just now. And, and we never take too seriously a relative strength correction like that. Um, and that's why you'll see the bullish watch list uh, icon flies. So that one is technically not yet fading. But I would say VEA, which is the developed markets, I, the labeling failed. Google. Thank you, Google. Uh, <laughs> VEA, which is XUS stocks. Um, mid cap US, MDY, and IWM, just a disaster. And look at that money flow. We're under distribution there. I IWM, of course, contains a lot of the regionals. That's true. But we also would say that's an economically sensitive cohort of stocks where, yes, the regionals are getting sold hand over fist, but small caps were in favor before that uh, uh, Silicon Valley bank collapsed. And, and let's not forget that the the broader market tends, the, the IWM tends to lead. Yep. So let's look at a deeper dive of just the U.S.'s relative strength. So we're going to look at um, basically combine uh, sector ETFs and subsector ETFs. So, you know, XLK, XLC, examples of uh, parent sectors. They're both two of 11 total slivers of the economy. And uh, let's, listen, that's where the strength is. You can see it. It's XLC uh, communications, but we looked at the uh, what comprises that and a good 60% of the XLC. Well, first of all, it's seven companies and it's Google, it's Meta. Facebook, yeah, it's te techie media companies. It's, it's the same companies that are holding up the XLK and the Qs. Right. It's the yeah. same exact thing. And you it's can see semiconductors like have been a real bastion of strength. But what causes me concern is suddenly money flow turns negative. Yeah. So they're starting to sell semis, which have had a nice run. You go go look at the chart and you'll see. And underneath that, what do we have? Another kind of sub permutation. XITK is another tech fund. 
And so there it is. That's what's in favor. That's what the sea of green is all about. Now, there's a few things possibly rotating into favor. XLP, consumer staples, that's the stuff you have to buy, right? Toothpaste, um, milk, bread, uh, new shimmer, floor wax, and a dessert topping, right? It's mm -hmm. not to date me to the 70s, but I just did. <laughs> and I guess the one bright spot and maybe rotating into favor software and services, that's XSW. Um, average 7th, 13th, most recent 10 days, a very bullish money flow. Trend not there yet. That one would suggest perhaps it's going to rotate into favor, though it's had a, you know, it hasn't had a, it hasn't been a straight up ride. You, you know, Mike, I'm sitting here looking at this and I'm wondering, should there be a black swan event, some unforeseen event um, that causes panic selling with, with, with money so tightly allocated to so few things? Right. Um, it, it presents what could be a hell of a liquidation event. Like it a really could. And event. I think that's what I think you and I are both, we're dancing around it because the evidence doesn't suggest there's panic now, but, but per, market participants are setting up for that eventuality. It's very clear. Institutions are the market. They're the smartest players in the room. They're the smart money. And that's relative strength is the one way to pick up what they're doing. But just the, the concentration of, of of where money is going right now, I think, is actually pretty dangerous. The more I sit here and look at what you put together. Seven companies. Yeah. Essentially. Yep. No question. Hey, we're getting close to being done. By the way, here are the companies that make up the XLC. That's 60, more almost 65% of the XLC. Yep. Unbelievable. Wow. Mm -hmm. So let me leave you with some uh, trading signals. And we're going to, so with the caveat that we just mentioned, that both AA and I feel that, um, that be careful when the market is this narrow. And remember, the trading conditions are, we're in the low to mid 20s as far as stock trading conditions. As far as a tailwind average, that is very bearish. And you always start with what is the market gonna give you before you worry about the sector, well, the country, the sector, the subsector, and the stock. And so we're starting from a bearish position Keep that in mind. There are two trading signals. I just want to explain them. And that's, this is how we'll wrap up today. Since okay. Cheat Sheets is a data service and there may be new people who subscribe and get stuff like this to their inbox. And while we have written literature, uh, sometimes you just need a lot of repetition. So the buy the dip signal is market forecast related. Um, AA, I'm going to actually try to bring up uh, this on, I'm going to use XSD as our example, even though the money flow went negative, which is a concern. But by the way, is expressed here with this bearish money flow. Okay, now for me, that's a deal breaker. When you start when in market conditions like this, if you don't have pretty much mostly all green lights, I don't like to trade it. But the signal does not require that. So what I want to do is explain the signal. Is that fair? Sure, understood. Okay. Um, so it's a market forecast based signal. And um, I'm going to try doing something that I'm not used to doing here. That means I got to share my screen and I got to share it in a way that's a little, that might make you a little seasick. So I apologize in advance. If we get close to wrapping things up here. Um, you need to be done uh, top of the hour, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got some time. Yep. So uh, we're five to 10 minutes away from wrapping. Great. For those of you who have a hard stop. All right. So I'm going to present my screen. And I do that by sharing the screen and I have to share the whole screen for this one. So this is going to make you see sick. I apologize. Here we go. Okay, there we go. There's the screaming vortex of death. And then I'm going to dial up XSD here in my trading account, which by the way, this paper money account, everything we do in cheat sheets is simulated. There's no real money. And none of this is trading advice. It's all uh, trading signals. So the first thing to be aware of is that XSD is sort of flattened out here. It's no longer making short-term higher highs and higher lows. It's consolidating. Uh, the expectation would be that the, uh, the, the instrument is destined to break out. There's a few reasons we say that. One is a technical reason where if we, if we connect the highs, recent highs in this uh, intermediate to short-term downward slope, we had what's called a valley peak, peak valley reversion after this consolidation where we made a series during the banking crisis, a series of lower highs and lower lows. We busted through that diagonal downtrend at higher than average volume. 
we pulled up, we threw back and retested. And then, you know, the expectation is this was a bounce and that, you know, the, the stock has headed higher. What's not shown here, which I think would be a deal breaker uh, for this one to trade as a trade, as a, a straight out naked stock. I actually took a trade using an unbalanced um, strangle, which means I'm selling puts and calls that are skewed neutral to bullish. But that's a different story. So what makes this a strong signal? First, we always start with the intermediate uh, time frame. That's the market forecast green line. That's the intermediate oscillator. When it is pointed up and above 50, that is the sweet spot for the market forecast. It is when you have the optimal trade-off between long-term reward and the risk of a reversal. When you and, and we actually have a trading signal called the intermediate trend progression signal when that line crosses above 50. That's not part of this signal. What's required for this signal from a classic standpoint is it's got to be above 20 and pointed higher. My personal rule and what I have built into cheat sheets to, to help everyone's win rate is the buy the dip signal does not fire. I don't believe it fires unless uh, this market forecast uh, indicator, it, this uh, intermediate indicator is above 50. Okay. So that's the first thing that it's got to be rising in above 50 or above 80. Once it's above 80, it's very bullish. It can be pointing in any direction. It's like any other oscillator. It can get pinned at the top for a while. So that's requirement number one. Requirement number two is that it pull down off of its highs, two to five day pullback ultimately is what you're looking for. But we express that in terms of this interme this near-term oscillator. Near-term oscillator has to pull down under 50, but stay above 20. And the third requirement is that the momentum line cannot be below five. It can be anywhere else except not below five. So there's a second reason besides money flow why this signal shouldn't be taken. And this is, this is not part of the rules of the trading system, but it is a caveat that I always add. If during this swing, the most recent swing, there has been a move to below five, that would negate any buy the dip signal. We would, in other words, we want that market uh, momentum line to clear that that low point by getting back up here. You know, to make a new, a very short term high. Mm -hmm. um, so that market forecast uh, near term, I'm sorry, momentum indicator, the red line. If it's finished below five in the last, you know, in in the day or two leading up to that signal, and that would be the case here. That happened on three twenty two. And what's today's date? Twenty six. Yeah, so two trading days ago. Yeah. Um, that's a negator, okay? And you won't pick that up on cheat sheets. That's why it's always good to, um, even if you're not, if even if you have an unfunded uh, thinkorswim account, it's really good to pick this up. The market forecast is worth it. Okay. Um, now, what's not required, another thing that's not required of the signal, but I like to make it um, a personal point, is that when this yellow or mustard colored line is pointing lower, that is a long-term forecast oscillator. You want the wind at your back and you want it to be rising. It can be above 20, preferably above 50, but rising or above 80 in any, any direction. Notice here though, it's curled. And I'll bet if I go back to cheat sheets, I'm going to see that it's moved from a very bullish or bullish position, it's below 80, so it's bullish, above 50, below 80, trending up, bullish, optimal sweet spot. When you have this and this, both shaking hands in bullish agreement. And then you have the buy the dip signal. It's a wonderful thing. But we have money flow that's weak. And we now have this thing going the opposite way in what's called. And I'm going to see if it's on cheat sheets here. Excuse my uh, excuse my horrific uh, seasick inducing level here. <laughs> but there you have it. The long-term forecast, neutral minus. Yeah. So... Those two things keep me from taking this signal, but it is a legitimate signal. If I were to take a signal like this, double A, I like to do things like cash secured puts, vertical put spreads, sold put spreads, maybe a credit call spread, but I think, or I, I'm sorry, a, a debit call spread, but that I think is really aggressive for the market conditions we're in. Yeah. De defined risk, whichever, whatever solution yeah. you come up with. Yep. Yeah. All right. So that's how to do the uh, the trade. But I think I think we've painted a compelling picture for let's wait and see a little bit here. 
Yeah. From a bullish perspective. Now, if you're a bear, be looking for the bottom of the stack for opportunities, especially because we did rally on Friday. There may be some neat little short opportunities here. Like, why does XRT just tempt me? Let me look at XRT and then we'll go. Okay. You know, I'll tell you, there's there's one that I found this morning that I'm 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 pretty anxious to take a closer look at on the open tomorrow. And it's also in retail. So I'm interested what XRT By the way, XRT would have been good to take it into the close uh, on, I guess this would have been Wednesday, yeah. right after the Fed. Mm -hmm. They get right there. Downward slope, a little rever mean reversion. I, you know, listen, it had a nice up day yesterday might continue um but i would be stepping ready to short this yeah uh go ahead and give me yours and then we'll wrap things up sure tgt tgt target and from market forecast uh, perspective very bearish yeah in fact almost a bearish cluster so could we could expect a reversal but notice the long-term lines rolled over here so yeah. Double A is probably just waiting for a little bounce back up to this downtrend line, right? Hoping for a little bit of a rally uh, first part of the week there. A little rally and then short it, and there you go. All right. Well, hey, guys, it's been uh, a pleasure. I want to get back to my um, back to my disclaimer just so I can have that. You guys are all smart enough to know this. Cheat Sheets is a data service that's designed to help improve your decision-making Mine and AA's opinions are exactly that. We have an opinion as well as other orifices and appendages that are singular <laughs> in nature. And uh, we would say that we're not licensed to give personal financial advice. Every trader is going to have a different set of personal circumstances. So we don't like to give out trading guidance, but I'd say we're both around for any sort of uh, educational question. And I can be reached and can pass those on to AA through Substack, our uh, stockcheatsheets.substack.com. There's a way to get in touch with me. You can also leave a comment here and uh, we'll answer it. We have onboarding videos and we have uh, how-tos and we'd love to have you become part of the Cheat Sheets universe. Remember, in all access, basic membership is free. You get data delivered to your inbox multiple times a day or multiple times a week, I should say, sometimes per day. And... Uh, and uh, and then for premium subscribers, we uh, we go deeper and broader into different asset classes and single stocks, single company stocks. And uh, for five bucks a month, you can get a whole bunch of trading signals. Yeah, pretty economical service. I would say for the cost of free, why not sample the service? And and I found it and people are concerned. You don't do anything with their personal information. You don't try to sell them anything. You don't sell their information. Right. I think we only collect, well, so I never see their credit card data. Um, yeah. That's Substack, right? They're the intermediary and they, you know, they take their cut and then I get my whatever, you know, they take their four bucks and I get my dollar. <laughs> yeah. But as far as email addresses, things like that, there's, that's you right. don't do anything with any of that. Yeah. Nope. Sure don't. Sure don't. Hey, Dubs, great having you along. This was a, this was a good one. I think we're both kind of feeling the, uh, the if then statement uh, hanging over the head of the market. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking for ways to protect my capital. I think that's wise. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Become an all access member at stockcheatsheets.substack.com to get free trade entry signals delivered to your inbox.